our guest artist is here. I'm David Tanner. I'm the um, Dean for Arts and Cultural Resources. And um, I'm joined by artist Lisa Nanny, who um, has a um, uh, solo exhibition up in our project space at the Freeman Gallery. And we're super excited to talk about that today. Um, but as more people are gathering, um, I just want to welcome everyone and uh, extend some thank yous. Certainly, first of all, thank you to Lisa um, for sharing her really amazing work with us. I cannot wait for everyone to come and see it in person. So hopefully um, this discussion that we're having today will trigger folks to come in and see it. Um, also want to thank Jim, her husband, both Lisa and Jim have spent, I don't even know how many days uh, traveling and, and installing um, the work uh, in the show. And uh, I just want to thank you all for your dedication for that. Um, also, the gallery staff that helped with this um, project, that's um, Rich and Kate, Abby, Stephen, um, as well as Kara, our um, office assistant in uh, the CFA, and all of our attendants as well. So Maya, um, Ben and Brennan, and our new attendants, Estella, Zakara, as well as Kenya. Um, also, a few thank yous to the folks um, in the broader community who help us here at Albright the communication staff, so Carrie and Heidi, they work on publications like the one that you see in front of you here, uh, the poster. Um, also, um, our facilities and catering staff, um, we do have an event coming up this week um, that they'll make sure everything is clean for and um, have fabulous food for. I'll tell you more about that in a second. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly our administrators, President uh, Fetro, as well as Provost Campbell, always supportive of everything arts and culture here uh, in the CFA. And finally, the Visual Arts Committee, um, led by our chair, Yacht Van Leer, and all the folks on that um, that have served so diligently. Um, they're the ones that help us bring all of these exhibits here, along with our donors. Um, and I want to thank um, our donors as well for helping us um, realize all the great shows that we have here. Now, for those reminders, um, the gallery is open Tuesday through Friday from 9 to 5 p.m. You can come in, it's free. Just walk right in and see these great shows. It's also open on Sundays from one to four. So after this, you could pop over there and see uh, this work in person as well. Um, there are two other shows that are up. Um, Forever by Mitch McLaughlin is um, a screening in the foyer gallery. Uh, that's a, an interesting digital video work um, and really, uh, that'll be up also through um, mid-October, um, along with Lisa's show. Uh, and that particular work um, uses LiDAR um, technology uh, and also references AI. Uh, and I don't want to spoil um, kind of the theme of it. I want you to come out and see it, but it's a really interesting take on um, how AI can influence one's uh, and really impact one's personal life. Um, and then um, in the main gallery, we also have Matt Garrison's um, curated show, Parallels and Rupture. That'll be up through the end of the semester. That includes a wide range of artists um, and a wide range of media. Um, we'll hear more about that show on Thursday when Matt gives his presentation in Klein Hall at 4 p.m. Um, and then after, um, for um, both Matt's um, Parallel and Ruptures exhibit, as well as Lisa's show, we will have our kind of public opening reception. So that'll be on Thursday. Everyone's invited, it's free. There's gonna be some yummy food, um, good stuff to eat and drink. Um, and I hope you all will come out for that and celebrate um, all three shows. And then finally, if you haven't, um, and I'm gonna switch off here so y'all can see me. Let's see. Because I want to also show you that the season magazine dropped. Um, for the CFA. So if you have not seen the Arts and Culture magazine, um, definitely get a copy of this. This includes great information about not only the things that are happening in the Friedman Gallery, but what's happening in Albright's Theater, uh, the music department, fashion, all the lectures that we have every year as well. Um, so grab one of those. They're all over um, campus and make sure that you um, get in your experience events um, before they get gone. Uh, which this is one of, so I just want to remind everyone to stick around. We'll have a poll coming up midway through the lecture and then at the very end. And you need to, if you're um, getting experience credit, you need to participate in both polls to get credit today. Okay. All right. So without further ado, 
let me introduce um, Lisa Nanny. She is our guest artist today. I'm so um, glad and fortunate to have her uh, mm -hmm. with us. Just a little bit of information about her. She is a sculptor and an installation artist whose work uses neon, metal, acrylic, and glass to visualize energy flow in our environment. She also creates drawings inspired by her sculptures, and she received her MFA from Rutgers University um, before then moving to New York City, where she lived for nearly 25 years. After that, she moved to Bucks County, so just um, across the way as our neighbor here in Berks, uh, where she currently resides. Um, she's had shows all across Pennsylvania and New York, and her work has previously been seen at the Freeman Gallery in the fall of 2020. One, in the National Traveling Exhibition, Blurring Boundaries, The Women of American Abstract Artists, 1936 to the Present. Um, Nancy's solo, uh, Nanny's solo exhibition um, features current work from her Flow series, along with vibrant works on paper that serve as sculptural studies. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, all of this today. Uh, and I'm going to lead off with our first question to get us started. And if you've seen this um, fabulous show, you know that there's um, not just neon works, um, but there are sculptural works as well as drawings. Um, uh, and if if that hasn't piqued your interest, then I don't know what will. So hopefully you guys will come out and see it if you haven't seen it. So let's get started with our first question. Are you ready, Lisa? Mm -hmm. All right. So um, as I just mentioned, you've had a long career as an artist. Um, you worked for 23 years in New York City uh, after earning that MFA from Rutgers. I'm curious though, has your work always included neon in your 3D sculptures and installation? And if not, what was your earlier work like and how and why did your creative process change? Well, uh, in graduate school, uh... I was involved with uh, photography uh, and I actually, as a TA, uh, taught black and white photography uh, in the dark room. So I sort of consider myself a photographer, um, but I got very involved with uh, creating temporary installations um, and then photographing them and then the photograph would end up as the artwork, uh, a record, uh, but I considered it the artwork. It was a way of recording an experience of um, the process of, of creating like some sort of sculptural site-specific installation or an actual installation that was just on the wall. Uh, and that way I could use, um, Temporary materials, they didn't have to be metal or something, you know, like clay that was fired. They could be very temporary. And in a sense, it was a documentation. Um, when I moved to Brooklyn, I had, um, I was fortunate to get quite a large space in an old, uh, it was a factory building and this was in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. It had been a, um, uh, I guess a weaving um, factory that made blankets. So um, the whole building was, was a factory building and artists moved in, which was very exciting during the eighties in Brooklyn. Um, that did allow a lot of artists to, to get loft spaces. And so with, this new space that I had, I was able to create larger installations. And um, if you want to put up that first image, yeah. uh, that would explain a lot. Um, the material was was something that I could. Um, it was just a not fragile, but it was just a sheet metal fabrication that I did. So it was, and it doesn't exist now. It, the only thing that exists are the, photo, the photographs. Um, and you, it's interesting too, because with photography, light is very important. So 
I think light was still part of your creative process. It sounds like at that time too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. And this piece is actually, um, there's a sensor in the main structure. So um, when somebody walks through this, um, this is supposed, the name was transmission tower, then the light would come on and uh, the red lights would always stay on. And the same with the yellow, the yellow lights. So I would create, this one was one that was made with metal. The ones that I'd done before were pieces of wood that I had painted to look like metal. Um, because when you're documenting with a photograph, it changes the aspect of the material because you're dealing with um, light and dark color. So you can make a material look like metal, even though it's not metal. Um, but this piece um, is with fluorescent lights because at that time, that's what I was using was fluorescent lights. And um, I did a number of sort of temporary installations like this in my uh, loft. Um, and then I just became very, I felt I was limited because there are only so many colors that are available in fluorescent lights. And um, plus they're, they're straight. <laughs> So um, I was talking to a colleague of mine um, when I was working at Princeton University. I was the sculpture shop uh, supervisor and he was teaching photography, but his side job was a neon, he was a neon artist. And he said, you know, you really should try neon because you can get any color and any shape. And I thought, wow, okay, I never even thought of that. And that's that's how it uh, that's how it all started. <laughs> I love that. It's I think it pinpoints such an um integral part of how collaborative art can be, and especially with artists um talking and having critiques with other artists and conversations um about you know their creative process. So um this, not that you were having a problem, but it just opened your eyes to a different, you know, a different tool uh, within that. That's a great story. Yeah, it, it's so important to be open-minded and talk to other artists uh, who, who may be in a completely different discipline and talk about their their process and, and what tools do they use? What, uh, how do they go about creating? with let's say paints or clay. And um, there's a lot you can learn. I mean, this was just a casual conversation and it just opened up another world for me. That's amazing. So I'm gonna move to this next image because I think this, we start to see the transition then when you've started to incorporate some of these other materials. So this one, um, this was done in Brooklyn and um, at that time I was going to a neon shop in Brooklyn and they were fabricating the pieces for me. I would make the sculpture first and then have the dimensions of the sculpture um, before I got the neon pieces fabricated. And um, this started a series, because I like to work in series. I know some people say, why do you do that? But I don't know, I just like, I like working in series, but this, uh, I began working with um, copper and alumina as my two materials. And uh, I'd associate the red neon, as you can see on the left-hand side, um, with the copper, uh, because I guess the, you know, thinking about the color of copper, the color of the neon, and then the aluminum on the other side, I would associate with the blue, which is argon. And so a lot of the sculptures I did um, starting, like this was done in 95, through the 90s sort of went through this uh, combination of copper, aluminum, and uh, argon and neon. 
So, uh, and this is also the works that I were doing were working with the idea of uh, electrical current moving from one part of a sculpture to another part of the sculpture, just as you can see with this one. It's sort of traveling from the red, going across, spanning the space between the two sculptures and then going back down to the, um, to the blue of the argon. So that was, um, if you go to the next one, then this one also the same idea, um, the neon red, is associated with the copper. Um, this one is called uh, Neon Ray Gun. And um, the target is the, uh, with the circle is, is aluminum. And I started also thinking about how um, it's not just particularly a circuit that is connected with wires or connect, so you can actually follow the path of the electricity, but it can travel through the air, through space. And uh, so this is sort of the idea of, you know, a ray gun, a laser, uh, something pointing toward a target. And um, so there were a number of pieces that I did sort of with that idea of, uh, the current traveling from the copper to the aluminum or, or vice versa. In um, 2004, um, I had to leave Brooklyn. Uh, there was a large migration of artists out of Brooklyn because especially Williamsburg was becoming very popular and um, a lot of artists had to leave. The landlords were raising the rents. And so um, I left Brooklyn and I came to Bucks County. And um, this piece, the um, this is done at the New Hope Art Center in New Hope, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, this is an installation that has to do with uh, more of the environment. I started working with ideas of the environment and um, this one is more focused on um, the notion of the fracking that was becoming a big issue in um, Eastern Pennsylvania because the fracking companies were using water from the Delaware and other rivers. And so I wanted to, um, because I, I like to work in, in sort of a site specific manner and so I wanted the installation to relate to kind of what's going on with the Delaware and sort of not, not have it be a political, um, but just that was just sort of my way of getting involved in, in the installation. And so uh, at this point, when I started working in, in Bucks County, I began to explore um, other materials. Uh, this has, um, the drops in the background are glass. So I began to use glass and I began to use um, other colors. That's wonderful. Yeah, we're starting to see the evolution that is taking us uh, to the present here. Wonderful. Uh, this, this particular piece was done, um, I had a residency at the Vermont Studio Center um, in Johnson, Vermont which is a, a, a great place to go and visit um, for graduate students. It's, it's just a fabulous place. They have really great studios, really great facilities. And uh, during the residency, um, again, I wanted to do a site specific piece uh, that in this case dealt with, with water. And I wanted to use the water um, expressed in the yellow light that is um, sort of emanating from the sculpture and sort of traveling down um, to the glass circle sort of to look like a pool. Um, I do this because in that area of Johnson, Vermont, there are a lot of mountains and incredible waterfalls and streams. And it's, it's, uh, 
they don't have any problem with water shortage there. It's Vermont is pretty, it's very, uh, very interesting landscape. So uh, that's what this, this piece was about. Um, and again, sort of using the idea of expressing movement in a piece. Uh, this piece was done uh, in Governor's Island, which uh, is this little island that's along with um, the Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island, this is another island in uh, the New York Harbor that you can take a ferry to. And at this time, I was involved with this group called the Sculptors Guild. And so they had a residency in one of the old buildings on Governor's Island. And um, we would have our own room to create an installation. And we had a whole summer to, to do this. And it was, it was really an exciting experience and very unique. Uh, the island had been flooded, part of it, by uh, the superstorm Sandy. And so I wanted to build a piece that referenced that. Um, and I realized that uh, I needed to use other materials that were, again, using the idea that this was gonna be recorded or documented by a photograph and the photograph then becomes the piece. And so I was able to use um, different kinds of mylar, um, different types of plastic. Um, I had to darken the windows with uh, like a blue fabric to give it more of a, a darkened feel to it. Like there was uh, like a cloudy day. And um, then everything else is uh, acrylic that uh, was made specifically just for this piece with the idea of showing the water in, in, in terms of color and energy coming into the room. Um, and I, you know, a lot of exciting things happened that I wasn't even expecting uh, was, you know, the way the acrylic, well, actually it's mylar that started to sort of, um, not buckle, but the edges started to move up and they actually captured the, the, uh, the red light, which is the furthest part back from the sculpture. I had no idea that that was gonna happen, but it really made it look more kinetic and um, enhanced the sense of, of movement. So at this, at, at this point, this is 2016, I really started to focus on the um, notion of expressing movement uh, with uh, neon and argon lighting. And that's, this piece really, uh, this piece really started the whole flow series. I've been working with, with different things before that, uh, one of which is, is, I'm just gonna turn this, this piece, I don't know if you can even see it. Can you, is that visible enough? Let me stop sharing so they can see it. Yeah, there, there you go. That's a little bit bigger now. Yeah, so that's a sculpture uh, that I did uh, in the early, um, 2000s and it's um this one is called cosmic intersect and i was doing things that were relating more to the uh the solar system the galaxy uh, i just that was sort of an interim sort of theme that i was working with uh, before i got involved with these installations um so i yeah, it just really needs to be a little darker. But anyway, I just wanted to show you that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. All right, let's go back here because I think we've got one more to see in this initial, no, a couple more. Yeah, here we go. This piece, again, was um, kind of a residency. I was able to um, get to know uh, James Carroll, who runs and. Um, new arts program 
in Kutztown, which was, was just the most unbelievable program. They, they've had so many shows and they invite artists from, a lot of them are from New York, but from all over. And then they have this, um, this was called the Wall Project, where an artist would be, uh, again, sort of like a residency, you would have three months to come up with a uh, plan for a piece that was going to be, this is a, this is in a hallway going, as you can see where the glass is in the front door. In order to get to the gallery, you need to walk through this hallway. So um, I wanted to do something that again, accentuated movement in the hallway, um, sort of back and forth, you know, the arrows indicate one direction. And um, then the end pieces are sort of like the end of that space, but then there's more movement I used um, a transparent colored uh, acrylic, you know, that's, you know, just comes on a roll. And that again, I was trying to accentuate the idea of movement and the circle is sort of the center because I think circles always sort of indicate a center so that people could stop. That would be where they, the center of the wall was and then they could move in either uh, direction. So um, it was a it was a really kind of challenging experience because, as you can imagine, a hallway is pretty narrow. Yeah. So it's really hard to sort of step back. You know, everybody when they're working on a painting or a sculpture, and you know, you step back and you and you want to look at it and you want to look at it from different directions. But this uh, there wasn't a lot of room. Yeah. <laughs> so sort of always looking you know, sort of up and down the hallway, which really changed um, how the pieces were made. So it was a, it was a very good experience. Mm -hmm. And there've been a number of artists who have done um, hallway projects. So cool. I think I saw that uh, installed actually, if I remember right at, at NAP, because that was when I was here. So that might've been like 16 or 17, something like that. 17, 2007. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Yeah. And then this piece uh, was part of the Blurring Boundaries exhibit that came to the Friedman Gallery. It's the traveling exhibit of the AAA women artists. And I'm a member of the AAA, it was American Abstract Artists. And this, this show has traveled all over the country. And it was so exciting that it was here, you know, at Albright and Reading, because I'd never seen it. And so I, I was able to finally see the show, which is, which is amazing. That's an amazing show. Um, mostly painters, but there are a lot of different um, artworks in it. And so this piece is part of the Opposition series, which is the series that I did before the Flow series. So everything, um, all the pieces in that series, the works are deal with opposites. And the way I think about it is I think about it as the, the visual uh, light spectrum. I'm just gonna, sh I don't know if this is gonna show you. I'm just gonna show you, this is the, the visual lights spectrum. I don't know if you, can you see it? <laughs> Yep, yep. I stopped sharing so that they could see you, but yeah. a little so, bit. So um, that has to do with the the uh, color associated with the wavelengths in the visible light spectrum. So the opposition series, the one color, let's say the opposite. Okay, so the the uh, highest frequency is in the, of of the visible light spectrum is blue. So then that is the opposite would be the red, the red part of the spectrum, which is the longer wavelengths. And so all the pieces sort of had to do with the blue or an opposite red. Uh, in the case of the one that was at Albright in the show, Blurring Boundaries, it was uh, green and orange. So, um, 
and I also tried to sort of have, so what are what are these things that are opposing each other? You know, what it's not just color or wavelengths. Does it does it can you use metaphors? I mean, I just wanted to sort of open that up as um, a possibility. And with the piece in Albright, um, it's uh, blaze orange opposing uh, forest green. So I was very involved with the idea of sort of what's going on in the, um, this, what I noticed in, in Bucks County, Berks County, there's a lot of issues with um, hunting, um, you know, deer hunting, whatever. Uh, this is sort of, you know, blaze orange is associated with what a hunter has to wear when he goes out into the forest. And um, then I wanted that sort of, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to say that hunting is bad. If it's just that those two things in my mind is, is just sort of taking it beyond the color and possibly going into a metaphor. That makes sense, absolutely. Yeah, let me come back here to our next question then because this really gets into this whole idea of series that you talked about. So mm -hmm. the works that are currently on view in the Friedman's project space comprise works from your flow series, mm -hmm. uh, but you've had other series like you've just mentioned the opposition series what triggers you to really examine these concepts? How long do you usually devote to a particular theme? And I'm I'm gonna add one more question to that, which is, do you only work on that theme? Which I it sounds like maybe you don't, like sometimes you're working on two series at the same time, but if you don't mind to kind of share your thoughts on all of that. Yeah, I mean, it it's it's nothing, it's sort of not planned, you know, you're working. I was like, again, I was working with these pieces that I showed you that had to do with the solar system. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, then I was doing, so I was doing a number of pieces that had to do with the solar system and the moon and the sun. Um, and I thought, you know, that's, I sort of ran out of sort of things to focus on. <laughs> And um, I thought, no, I need to be, I need to go into something that's a bit more abstract that can, uh, it doesn't have to rely on a metaphor. And that's when I started thinking of, of what is the thing that really interests me? It goes back to the work that I did in Brooklyn. It's sort of transmission of energy, um, movement of energy that is, um, in the environment uh, that we experience. And um, so the opposition one was sort of the energies conflicting with each other, opposing each other, uh, which happens also in nature and, and in, in the cosmos and in the world. And, um, but I'm not gonna get too political. <laughs> but, uh, and then sort of from that, I wanted to go in the direction of what I experienced at Governor's Island, which was really the movement in one direction of um, of the energy. And, you know, there's so many, I mean, there's, everything is moving, right? Everything. I mean, the people are moving um, physically. There's, there's movement in the air and the atmosphere. There's movement in the ground. There's movement uh, in space. I mean, it, it's, so I just, found that that was a very exciting experience, especially when you start thinking about uh, the direction of the movement, like how is it moving? Where is it moving to? Is it going uh, left to right, right to left, north to south? Um, so that's, the series allows, for me, allows me to explore, um, you know, all these different parts of, that idea. And it really opens up a lot of options in as far as materials and presentation and, um, and fabrication. Absolutely. Um, so my next question is uh, for Lisa, your works, especially those that we're gonna see here in just a bit in, in the current exhibition, Incorporate Neon, 
uh, and that uh, requires quite a bit of scientific knowledge because you've talked already about the different colors and things like that. So for those who are science-minded, and we might have some science students, um, could you, for example, um, talk about the different gases that cause the different colors? And um, you've already elaborated on some of your choices um, and why you made those, but um, talk about the science behind some of the art as well. Neon and argon are uh, gases that uh, are pumped into glass, glass tubing. I actually have, a, this is an example. All neon glass, it starts out like this. It's, it's straight and it um, depends on um, whether you have 10 mil, 12 mil, 14 mil. So the glass comes in different sizes. And this one is clear. Um, the other ones, you can have all different colors. You can imagine this being, the glass being a certain color that's actually made, um, or you can have a powder, which when uh, energized by the gases, the elect with the electricity will turn a color. So you can have uh, clear, you can have colored glass tubing, and you can have powdered uh, coating. And um, the neon gas in a clear tube uh, will be red. The argon gas in a clear tube will be blue. And um, the, I'll just show you the, you start out with a drawing. Let's say here's one of my drawings. Okay, you make a drawing that is scale the way you want the piece to be um, size and you take your tubing with either at this point there's no gas this is just the tubing and it gets heated over a flame um, a torch and then you spin it and you have a certain point where you're going to make a bend and you also have a blow tube and a cork on one end the blow tube is at one end, the cork is in the other. It gets to a certain heat and then, then you bend. And when you bend and you get to the point where it's starting to bend, then you place it onto the drawing. So you're going from something that's straight, you're bending, and then you place it right on the drawing. Um, you have to use like a screening over the drawing so the drawing doesn't catch on fire. <laughs> um, and so that's how the bending occurs. It can be simple bends uh, where you're just taking a straight thing and making one bend, or you're using a bigger flame and then you're making a curved bend. And you can imagine somebody who is doing lettering, all the bending that's involved. When you see a sign that has lettering, huge amount of bending, and it takes a huge amount of skill and once, the, once you have decided your piece is bent, then you make a decision about what gas do I want? What gas is gonna work with that piece? And you make a decision of, is it gonna be just clear, argon blue, neon red? Um, or are you gonna choose you know, the colored um, glasses? Well, actually, you'd have, to use, you'd have to choose that first because you'd have to bend those colored glasses. Once, once you've decided what kind of gas you're using, then um, the electrodes have to be put on to your bent piece. And then at that point, there's a process where there's a vacuum that takes out all of the air that's in your unit. It's called a unit. And once all the gas is out, then they uh, pump in your either neon or argon gas. And um, so that's the whole process. The um, electrodes are then sealed and the electrodes then, you start with hooking up the one end of the electrode to the other end of the electrode with the current of the transformer. And that's, that electrifies the gas. 
That's amazing. Yeah. I know when yeah. I asked you and in kind of envisioned the show, I thought, okay, you're going to come and hang these things on the wall and we'll flip a switch and it'll be beautiful. It is beautiful, but the process you just described is so labor intensive. And I had no idea what I was asking of you <laughs> when I asked you to come and install these works because, um, well, let's, let's look at some of these so that people can see that if you don't mind let's share some of the other set of images that you've got sent to us here and let's see let's start with this image here so this is what you were just talking about with the bends and the different colors all of that yeah these um these pieces some of them i bent um and some of them I had uh, bent for me. Uh, the more elaborate pieces, the one, for instance, uh, on the far right, which is um, yellow aqueous flow, which is on the pedestal, uh, that was bent for me. Um, and um, these that are visible, I bent most of these. And to give an example, um, the drawing that I showed you, this one. So this was actually for the uh, the piece that, that you can see that's above um, the yellow straight. And this is in the uh, oxygen flow piece. Mm -hmm. So that's that piece that was bent. Wow. Uh, that is pure argon, that's what argon in a clear glass tubing looks like. So that's the gas, argon gas. And uh, an example of the neon gas in clear tubing is the bottom part of radon flow. That's just neon gas in um, the clear glass tubing. Uh, the neon gas, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the chemistry of it, but it glows, uh, I think about, I think it's four times brighter than the argon gas. So usually when you see, when you see a sign um, that's outside somewhere, um, you know, for a restaurant or whatever, it's usually neon because the neon is gonna travel further visually than the argon. The argon is a softer glow and it's usually used for um, a lot of indoor signage. And you can get a lot more colors with the argon gas in combination with different glass tubings than you can with neon. You know, neon is more restrictive because it's a very bright red um, gas. Uh, the other example of um, pure neon in, in glass tubing is all the way over on the right, the piece that's sort of swirl, uh, curvy. That is, um, that's just clear glass uh, that I bent and it's got, so it's pretty bright compared to, compared to let's say the one on the bottom, um, the green uh, gas flow, which is all argon. Those are uh, sort of blue and green argon. You can see the difference as far as the intensity of the light. Absolutely. Let's come back just a minute to talk about this piece in particular, because this is really, um, it draws your eye when you come in. It's the largest work um, uh, and goes from the floor all the way up. This is the one that's called radon flow uh, that you mentioned earlier. So with the red um, uh, on the bottom, the red neon, um, how do you achieve the colors then of the yellow and the orange kind of going up? How do you achieve those? Well, uh, the the red um, neon uh, is in the bottom tubing, and I enhanced it with uh, using red plexiglass on that bottom sort of uh, sculptural shape. So I also like to work with reflections. Mm -hmm. and I was first of all, I was very excited that uh, the gallery floor is very shiny. So I picked up the reflection, and I didn't. I didn't know that was ha going to happen. I was so happy, uh, but you can see the reflection in the plexiglass, uh, which sort of accentuates um, sort of the energy in the bottom of the 
um, the shape, which is supposed to refer to the way uh, radon comes up from cracks in um, basements. Mm -hmm. And uh, it literally seeps up from the ground. Um, it, Redding has a lot of uh, radon because there's a, a big vein of red granite in the ground there. So a lot of the readings are very high in Redding and Kutztown. And um, so that was the reasoning that I used the red uh, acrylic and this, the bottom piece is sort of a brown uh, acrylic. And then I tried to graduate the colors uh, sort of in a, in, in a sort of using the idea of like um, what happens when colors start to go from intense to uh, less intensity and they're going upwards in the environment. They start to get, uh, they start to change colors. And so that's why I used, um, this is a, a pink acrylic that's right on top of um, the sort of faux uh, basement uh, blocks there that I installed. And then this is, um, the other two pieces are orange coating um, with neon gas. And it's, so it's, 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 the, it's the powdered coating inside of the glass tubing. And um, then, uh, then I use the yellow, um, it's again, powdered coating. And um, that is argon gas. So it's gonna be less intense. And uh, let me correct myself. Actually, these, um, Oh, these tubings, the ones that are the middle shape, are actually green coating. And when you put neon gas in it, it fluoresces orange. So that's this is just a very unusual thing. Usually that's usually it's not, it doesn't happen that way. But that is the case with the coating in these um, the middle ones. It's it's actually a green coating that fluoresces sort of this orange color when you put neon in it. Very interesting. When you would put argon gas in it, it would be green. See, because then the coating would react with, with the blue gas. Let's look at the other side of the space then. That side is dark and um, kind of highlighted by all of this vibrant um, glowing light. On the other side though, we come back to your more traditional sculptures and some drawings as well. So take us through these. Well, these pieces, um, first I'll talk about the uh, plexiglass um, and glass pieces that you see on either side of the drawings. Um, I, I work with those because um, I can also um, explore the idea of using color uh, to express movement. And um, it is sort of a nice, it's sort of a freedom to work with materials that don't involve the neon because the neon, you always have to think about the wires and the electricity. And so it's a completely different way of working. And, and I can work much faster with these little pieces. Um, and I can get uh, more involved in uh, color theory because then I can start thinking about uh, how does red transition to orange transitioning to yellow. So I begin to think about the warm colors as part of the color theory. Um, and I also anodize the metal that supports the glass and the acrylic. Um, on the left side, that's actually a red anodizing. Um, and that's a whole process with aluminum. These are all aluminum um, pieces. Um, the one that you're looking at is a gold um, sort of, actually that's a chromate um, coating. So just these pieces are, uh, it's, they're faster. Um, the neon, working with neon is, is very expensive. You've got not only the neon, the process of getting them blown and um, putting the gas in, electrodes, the transformer, the wires. So this frees me of, um, of that expense. So they're, they're sort of fun, smaller pieces to work with. 
Mm -hmm. um, the they also work. I can also explore more um, the idea of direction with these because they're they're you don't have to turn them on and off. They're always what they are. What I found was really fascinating was I had no I when I put them in my studio, I work with natural light. I had no idea that I was going to get all these reflections underneath this yellow one mm. because of the way that um, it was lit. So that was that was a really nice discovery. And that is will actually will help me think about other pieces. Because a, a lot of things that happen when you're when you're creating, and I'm speaking to all the students there, is you can have this accident that happens or something that you didn't expect that could lead you to create something else. And that's that's really exciting. Absolutely. So that's a great transition to to look at your works on paper because these are a little bit different than um, the sculptures, the three dimensional works. So um, I think it would be fair for many folks who have some bit of knowledge to to think of these when they see these maybe as studies. So you know, often artists will draw something out on paper and then create a painting from that, or they'll do a series of drawings leading up to a painting or a sculpture. Um, but what I think is really interesting is you are almost doing the reverse here where your sculptures, your three-dimensional works influence your works on paper. So could you talk a little bit about that? So the, um, I, I love to draw. It's something I've always <clears throat> enjoyed doing. Um, it's, I just, you know, a flat surface, two-dimensional. Again, it's something that uh, I can, I can do without a lot spending a lot of money, which is always a factor. Uh, and there's a lot of freedom again with something to um, explore, especially in these drawings, uh, the combination of colors that initiated or initiated through the sculptures, but then I can take it further and uh, explore more color theory. Like how do you transition from a blue to a yellow? That's done with light in this particular sculpture. This sculpture is, is um, yellow, it's inspired by yellow aqueous flow, which is in the show. But to start thinking abstractly, I can look at the colors that are in the sculpture, but then when I want to translate it to two dimensional space on black paper, then it becomes, a, a I have to work more with like, the transitioning of colors and I uh, use a lot of um, these are uh, paint markers and then in between the paint markers I use color pencil and I start to transition like where what happens when I go from the dark blue to the light green you know I, I put in the colors that um, to me work and so that's in the yellow aqueous flow and I also use um, metallic inks that are, are colored and uh, try to sort of also, this also to me accentuates movement. It's also working with the idea of movement, but on a two dimensional uh, plane. And um, of course the one you can see is radon flow in the center where I tried to transition from um, and I wanted to make it abstract, but this one actually is sort of closer to the piece um, in the sense that it is, it sort of, you know, it's vertical. Uh, it goes from the dark red up to the yellow, but it is abstracted. So it's a way to sort of explore after you, for me, after I've made the piece, what's going on with the colors because working with colors is, you know, it's it's always very exciting and there's so much you can do with uh, the availability of the paint markers that are out now. There's so many different kinds. There's so many beautiful types of colored pencils. It's just, uh, it, it really gives um, a lot of way to explore color and work with color abstractly. And I just wanted to, say that you're talking about drawing. This is where I do my preparatory drawings. And I recommend any artist 
to get these books. But you can just write down and draw whenever you want. If you're walking through a park, you get an idea. Like for instance, this is um, this was my initial drawing for Radon Flow. And you see how different it is? This is how I started. And I have like probably 10 different drawings in my book before I get to the final process. So this is this is so important to have a sketchbook and just uh, always just put down, even, even if it's just like a glancing idea, that way you can come back to it and you can think about it and, or you can just, you know, it's just a drawing that you did in your sketchbook. But I really, this is so important to have these. And then you, and then you have, you know, you can do them by year and you can keep them um, and you can look back on them. I just think they're, they're really helpful. Absolutely. That's great advice. So that answers the question too, because you do use sketch sketches sometimes. Um, uh, it's just not what we might have um, thought looking at those particular pieces. Those come after. Yeah, those are definitely, those are afterwards. And they are, they are definitely more explorations in, um, in using color theory. Yeah, I think that ties back into with um, your earlier comment that also surprised me about some of your earlier works and how the photograph at the end that documents it is the work mm -hmm. in some regards. And, and especially because many of those pieces may no longer exist. Right. Um, so that's why uh, it's important to have um, pieces like that. And it's why we often do some type of trifold or catalog as well um, to, to really have that history for each show. Um, because once the show comes down, it's gone. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we also saw it particularly in installing your um, show that you mentioned direction and it was very important. And so as we were kind of collaboratively working on how it was gonna be laid out in the exhibition, I know you and I had conversations, Rich, our preparator was part of those conversations um, so that we understood what your vision was, um, you know, how it could work within our space and using Kind of our knowledge of the space and what was going to work with lighting and, and dimming areas um and i just that was such a great experience for me on that side of it um working collaboratively with you to realize a vision for the overall show too so i just wanted to to say thank you for that um we should open it up before we um issue our last poll um to uh questions from the audience um so let me um uh have stephen uh uh look through and see if there's anybody who's written anything in chat or in the um, Q&A. So if you do have questions, um, just write them there, type them there. Since this is a webinar, people can't just shout them out, unfortunately. Um, and then while folks are working on those, um, I wanted to just take at least a couple minutes if there's anything else that you want to let us know that you think um, is important about your work, please do that. Uh, I just think... Uh... <clears throat> I just want, I hope this was informative um, to the audience, especially students, uh, just to show that um, you can start out with one type of work and easily transition and not even realize that you're transitioning to another style of work and just um, be really open to that. You know, be open also to your teachers because they're gonna give you a lot of advice that you might not think about it until after you've got, left school and you're gonna remember that. And I, I had a really important professor in my undergraduate that has literally, I think about even now. And that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, I'm glad to see there's at least one or two of my students from my FYS. I know uh, one of our faculty members, Kristen is on here and um, some of her students I recognize as well. So. That's good advice, um, certainly for our students. I know one question that um, students are always like really interested in, sometimes they're hesitant, especially the first one out um, of the gate and you're, you're in that position this year, they're a little hesitant to sometimes ask questions, but um, people always wanna know like who inspires you, like what other artists inspire you, who do you look to for inspiration, things like that. Uh, well, you know, in my case, I've you know, looked at a lot of art and um, 
I would have to say that um, Keith Sonye, who is a uh, neon artist, who also went to Rutgers, oh. was a big inspiration for me. Uh, he's really the only artist that I know of that um, started out in his um, Rutgers sort of postgraduate and continued and his work has really evolved. Um, and he's an incredible, incredible artist. Uh, but, uh, you know, I like looking at painting. I mean, I like uh, looking at uh, different sculptors. My favorite uh, female sculptor is Alice Adams, who I've known for, who's a friend also, but I've known for years and years and years. And I just love the way she uses her materials and creates these in incredible sculptures and really uses the space uh, of a wall or a corner. Um, she's an incredible artist. So uh, I would have to say it, it's it's not just neon artists, it's other uh, sculptors. I like painting too. I mean, I, there are a lot of, a lot of uh, artists that I really like. Very cool. And, and you're still um, practicing art. One of the questions was, are you still making neon artwork today? And the works in the show um, are from your current series, you're still making work. Um, in fact, we've asked you to consider um, doing a site specific work uh, as well that we're really excited about. Um, one of the other questions that has come up is what um, impacted you when you were growing up that, um, made you consider art as an occupation instead of just a hobby. So what what was that defining thing that made you really say, this is what I wanna do with my life? You know, it's always a, um, it's always a quandary because you can get really involved as I did uh, in undergraduate and uh, making art and always being really excited about making art. But here's the problem. You need to have a job. You need to find a space to make the artwork. And those are always the two issues. How do you continue your artwork and have a job? And where are you gonna make the artwork? Where, how can you also have the time besides the job to make the artwork? Those are the things that I think are the hardest things for, um, young artists today and I really feel for them because um, it's hard to find a studio space you have to work I mean if you're lucky you can uh, get residencies and then you'll be given the space which is always a really good thing but uh, I, I just it was a struggle even after graduate I was lucky to get jobs um, as studio assistants in colleges and that allowed me to continue my artwork and somehow work out a, a way to get space and work. So it really, it really, it's a really tough thing. And just, you know, just even if you're just doing it in, in part of your bedroom, you just keep doing it. You know, you just, because something else could open up and then you'll have um, a job that'll link you to possibly meeting somebody who needs somebody to share a studio. So true. Yeah. And you never know what also is going to lead to another show. I mean, it's interesting that, you know, when I saw your work in the abstract show, the American abstract artist show, I knew right away, I was like, oh, this is, it just really stood out to me. It was so different. Um, and you came to the opening that had an impact on me. And I was like, let's investigate this more. It's so interesting though, because I didn't make the connection that I had already seen your work at the Knapp Gallery, um, mm -hmm. although that had been several years before. Um, so those little things can it, have an impact. And I, you know, putting yourself out there, you never know when that's gonna pay off as well. It may be a couple of years down the road, but it, it's definitely something that you have to do. You have to really um, be resourceful and keep at it um, and, and don't be discouraged. Yeah, that's, you have to really stick to it and yeah. just keep doing it and things will change and, you know, talk to other artists, make connections. That's really important. 
Absolutely. That's great advice. Um, looks like we have one last question here. And the question is, do you ever make changes to pieces that you have already finished? <laughs> <laughs> and that might be uh, another question might be, do you ever really finish a work or, or are you always tweaking it? You know, um, you know, as I showed you, I start out with, you know, the sketches and I do a lot of sketching. And then when I start to make the piece, um, I actually start doing measurements and um, figuring out the materials, how much of this material do I need? How, how am I going to drill this? How am I going to connect this? And um, I do a lot of work bec beforehand because every process involves making a lot of decisions. And I'll have to say that I get halfway through a piece that I think is almost done, and then I'll change something. So I'm always really open to that during the piece. Um, but I've, I've never had the, with the sculpture, and this is with the sculpture, drawing is different. I've never had a thing where I've actually uh, finished a piece and then changed it. Because the way I look at it is, that piece is the process that you went through from the beginning to the end. And then the next piece is something that you can take that change and incorporate. That makes sense. Thank you so much for sharing all of this great wisdom today. Um, I just want to thank all of our um, folks who joined us. Um, we'll go ahead and release that last poll. Thank you, Stephen. Poll is up. Thanks also to Stephen for being in the background and running the session for us. And we will, um, I think, see Lisa and Jim on um, Thursday, actually, mm -hmm. for the opening. So if you want to um, meet Lisa in person, thank her for being in the, the gallery and sharing her work. Um, if you have another question that comes to mind after this, you'll be able to see her on Thursday um, and uh, see the artwork in person, which really, it, it, you know, the photos were great, but seeing it in person is, there's nothing that compares to it. Um, especially with that light, the shadows that you were talking about, how those get cast, really, really interesting um, to see it in person. It takes on a whole new dimension for sure. Yeah. yeah. Very, it's very hard to photograph neon. So you really <laughs> need to see it. Yeah, I, yes. And as you know, I've mentioned before, um, we have a photographer um, uh, and we'll see, uh, this will be the first time we've asked him to photograph Dr. Pankratz to photograph a show like this. So we'll see what tricks he might have as well. So, <laughs> yeah, we're getting some thank yous coming in as well. So yeah, it is really mesmerizing. So thank you so much. Um, we'll stay on a little bit, but we'll let Lisa go uh, and uh, we'll see her on Thursday. We'll stay on until everyone has had a chance to do the poll. So thank you all so much. And thank you for the opportunity. This was really, really wonderful. Our pleasure. Enjoyed it. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.